I'm going to talk a little bit to begin with about what is the framing of how historically conservation and resource management and even some human planning have been done and about how climate change makes those things vulnerable and then I'll get to happy at the end. Um, but to begin with, pop quiz because you all work for media outlets. Media outlets always have quizzes in them. Uh, can anyone tell me what species have been named as threatened and or endangered because of climate change? Pardon? The red knot. The red knot. Anybody got anything else? Pika not actually listed, but good call. <laughs> Polar, bears. Polar bears. Polar bears. Does anyone know what the first species ever listed as threatened or endangered because of climate change was? I'll give you a hint, it's none of those. <laughs> coral. Snail. Two species of coral, Acropora cervicornis and Acropora palmata. Um, and they both live throughout the Caribbean. Historically, endangered species like this, we protect by protecting space. Um, unfortunately, for things like coral reefs, you've got sea level rise, increasing storm intensity, disease, uh, increasing water temperatures, all exacerbating um, the ability to protect. If you protect coral reefs with a marine protected area in a space, um, those things are all still going to affect it. The protected area does not protect from those kinds of stressors. Um, Protected areas in Australia have attempted to not only protect coral reefs, but other things. Things like the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is one of the largest marine parks in the world. Um, they were actually pretty smug back when coral bleaching was happening in 1998 in the Caribbean. The Australians are saying, well, it's just because you haven't protected enough of the Caribbean. The Great Barrier Reef, we're going to be fine because we've protected this whole coastline. Well, two years later, they were monitoring their coral bleaching by aerial survey. They were flying over to estimate percent cover. So not even really big protected areas can protect a threatened or endangered species or even a whole ecosystem. Restoration is another tool that we use. Um, this is coastal restoration I'll act, and wetlands restoration. I'll be running. It, see, again, I'm following Kim's lead. Had I thought about it, I would have put down the session. Tomorrow, there'll be a working group in the afternoon on wetlands conservation, uh, restoration, and mitigation. Um, so this is the Chesapeake, where they've been doing a lot of work to um, put back uh, the, the bay grasses that were there historically. Um, and they're using, at least when they started this project, they're using the same species of bay grass that have always been in the Chesapeake. But if you look at sort of the maps of temperature along that region, you see that the Chesapeake is at this interesting confluence. Part of it has to do with um, the Gulf Stream, but part of it actually just has to do with warming temperatures up the East Coast. And those warming waters are causing rain shifts. And so the species that used to be in the Chesapeake was at the southern end of its range, and a different species came up from the south, and the Chesapeake was the northern end of its range. They chose to do the restoration with the species that this was at the bottom end of its range, so you can sort of see the problem there, is that the species that they were putting back in uh, won't be living in that area probably for much longer. Um, improving fisheries management. Fisheries management, something you've probably all heard about, the demise of things like cod, rockfish. Um, this is some maps of salmon. It turns out that fish ranges are shifting pretty dramatically, and ocean acidification is also going to be affecting fisheries. Um, Current fisheries management practice don't, doesn't really take either one of those things into effect in how it determines what catch limits are and where um, different kinds of fishing equipment and um, timing of when fishing can take place. Uh, improving water quality, another thing we've spent 50 years working on. Uh, we've been making great progress in it. Um, it turns out that there are all sorts of synergistic effects between climate change and water quality. This is a little map showing how arsenic is affected by temperature and UV and a host of other things. But climate change through changes in temperature, changes in pH, changes in uh, the amount of light that can penetrate the water column all make a lot of the compounds that we have been regulating more toxic or make the species that are sensitive them, to them more sensitive. Um, resulting in a lot of the advances that we've made to make waters cleaner, uh, not as effective as they uh, would have been without climate change. So now I get to the happy part of the story. I've just told you that everything we do is for naught, and we might as well forget it, but I'm going to tell you it's not. There are things we can do about it. So um, 
frequently people talk about climate change in terms of vulnerability and in terms of three kinds of response options. And I'm going to talk about each of those kinds of response options in a few examples. So simply put, this is resistance, resilience, and response. So you can think of it in terms of resistance would be trying to keep things the same as they ever were. Resilience, I don't know how many of you were, none of you were in the plenary this morning. We talked about floating houses. Um, there were uh, the idea of being able to respond to change within the location you are. In response, you just pull up stakes and you move your tent somewhere else because it's not working out for you here. EcoAdapt sort of reconstructs those three ideas into five because apparently we're splitters, not lumpers. Um, and these are the five tenets that we use when we talk about stuff. And I'll use some of this language as I'm going through the examples. Um, about protecting adequate and appropriate space for a changing world. So when you think about where you're putting those protected areas, are you thinking about where species are going to move? Some of the maps Kim was showing you before, look at some of those ideas. Where are things now? Where will they be? The second is reducing non-climate stressors that exacerbate or exacerbated by climate change. When I talked about water quality issues, I was dwelling in that space. The third is managing for uncertainty because you never know what's going to happen. Um, and climate change is full of surprises. Uh, ocean acidification, for example, that I talked about in the fisheries management part. 10 years ago, I would say probably no one was talking about ocean acidification. And now we're just beginning to realize the full range of impact that that's going to have on our world. Fourth is reducing the rate and extent of local and regional climate change. There are things that you can do locally to ameliorate climate change and make the effects not as large. In aquatic systems, in freshwater aquatic systems, one of those tools is maintaining riparian vegetation um, to keep things a little bit cooler. Um, in marine systems, there are crazy ideas about putting tubes in to support upwelling when it shuts down naturally. Um, and then fifth is reducing the rate and extent of global climate change, because if we don't do something on the mitigation side of the coin, the adaptation side of the coin has limits to what it can achieve. Another tool that we've started using is the adaptation ladder of engagement. And the idea here is we're trying to get people to understand that there are a lot of steps to do this. So as you're starting to learn about stories about how people are engaging on climate change, a lot of the work that's being done today is really down at this bottom end of the stage. So finding out what is it that um, climate change is doing, recognizing that climate change is having a pro causing a problem. The assessment step is figuring out exactly what are those issues that are coming up. Are there opportunities that are coming up? Really doing it in a methodological way rather than just a gestalt. Yeah, I think there's a problem. Um, cr then creating a plan to see what could you do about those vulnerabilities or how could you take advantage of opportunities. The implementation step, the, the precious implementation step of we have a plan, let's actually do something with it. There are lots of adaptation plans in the US right now. And I'd say a fairly small portion of them are really put into implementation fully. Some of them have done a little bit of them, but not all of them. Monitoring is figuring out whether or not what you've implemented actually affects any change. Does it improve conditions? Integration, how, you, how your plan works with other plans, how well you incorporate what the terrestrial folks are doing if I'm caring about the freshwater and marine components. Uh, making sure that human communities are thinking about the landscapes around them. Um, making sure that all those pieces are creating the mo most holistic strategy and action possible. Um, and then finally sharing all of that. And events like the one you're at right now are part of that sharing opportunity. Okay, so putting all of those pieces together, I'm going to give you a couple of examples in the marine world of where people are really starting to think about this. And I'm doing this very quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but all of the, I'll give you access to where more on all of this can be found. So going back to my friends, the coral reefs, um, there is hope for them, despite the fact that there's war warming waters, ocean acidifications, and what a friend of mine refers to as synergasms. Um, and those solutions include cra some crazy things and some really functional things. So Great Barrier, in the Great Barrier Reef, they have done a really broad scale effort to improve water quality across the whole region. Because what they discovered is that the worst bleaching they had was in areas where the water quality was most diminished because of terrestrial runoff. And they've been doing a lot to reduce nutrient outflow from agricultural lands and human communities. Um, because that was have the, the, they saw more bleaching where there was reduced, diminished water quality. And that's actually proven quite successful and they had a good amount of recovery in their coral reefs. Um, 
In the Florida Keys, they created an action plan, a copy of which is down on the EcoAdapt table downstairs, you can find it online, that dealt with a whole array of um, issues in the region and involved tens of partners to make it happen. But they did things like how do you reduce those nutrient stressors and other stressors like tourism, um, boat anchorage, uh, fishing in the region. Um, they tried to prioritize the protection of resilient locations. There were some places where they noticed there wasn't as much bleaching, either because the coral were resilient or the area had some natural protection because of blue and green water. And if anyone wants to talk further about that, I'll be at the bar with Kim. Um, restoring reefs with resistant strains. There are actually folks from TNC who are down there culturing corals uh, who are of more resilient strains, less likely to bleach, um, and getting those back in where they do restoration projects. Um, and finally, the Florida Keys shockingly started to demand action on mitigation, which was a really exciting moment to see an entire community recognize that they would in fact be underwater within the century. Um, building infrastructure. We have all sorts of coastal infrastructure. Some of it doesn't realize it's coastal until a little bit later down the road. Um, but people are starting to think about how does warming air temperature and changing precipitation patterns and sea level rise um, affect what they're doing. So some of those things is that people are building on coast planning for sea level rise. They're building th structures um, like those houses in the Netherlands um, or other communities where they're um, identifying that yes, the sea level will be coming up in our region and we should just, if we're gonna build here, we need to build structures that can deal with that. Either we build them up on stilts like you see in a lot of US, especially East Coast and Gulf Coast coastal communities, um, or you um, build with floodplain setbacks so that the water can go around the community. Um, there are people building roads, planning for beach migration, so rather than continuing to try and build that road right along the coastline, who knows why anyone thought that was a brilliant idea to begin with, but they are now setting them back much farther with the, the societal acceptance of you can't have a road on the water, or if you do, it's gonna have to be an elevated structure. Um, different forms of water, because when I was told I could talk about water, I had to push the envelope about what that meant. Um, so snow and ice, the birthplace of fresh water in much of the Intermountain West, um, warming air temperatures and changing precipitation clearly affecting it. These are not the standard examples, but they're such crazy examples that I love bringing them up because I think it forces people to think beyond just, we should put up snow, snow fences, is that what those are called, Molly? Snow fences, we should construct snow fences so that water goes into watersheds or build reservoirs. So this is what they're doing in other parts of the world. Um, in the Alps, they are insulating their glaciers with blankets during the summer so that they do not melt, so that they're available for skiing in the winter. Um, in in um, the Andes, they're actually doing things like if there are, if there's open rock face adjacent to glaciers, they are painting them in some manner white so that they can reduce the heat absorptive content. In some cases that's done with paint, in other cases it's very, very cleverly done with by encouraging bird rookeries so that you have more bird guano covering the dark rock. Um, and they also close off access to glaciers in both of those regions, just so that there's less disturbance on the glacier, so there's less melt, so that it's available for water and for the incredibly uh, important tourism industries. Um, on an even bigger scale, you can think about the glaciers and water management in Asia and the very, very large rivers that provide water for a lot of people. Um, you can think about California as a microcosm for this challenge now. Uh, and thinking about how do you prepare on different scales? How do you prepare for near-term flooding? And how do you prepare for seasonal and long-term drought? California skipped those two steps and just went to that one. Fisheries are a somewhat intractable problem. Fisheries have been a challenge for management for decades, um, and they're affected by all these things. They're affected by rising ocean temperatures, acidification, many of our responses to climate change and how we deal with coastal estuaries and coastal flooding further affect fisheries, um, making it n no easier. Um, the idea of using fisheries as a great local food source so you're decreasing food miles has the challenge of increasing consumption of fish while um, having added pressure on fish. Um, 
There are not a lot of awesome examples yet of improved fisheries management in the face of climate change. The most famous one um, is one that is occurring up in the North Pacific where the decision was a very bold, we have no idea how climate change is going to affect this fishery because it's been a frozen surface most of the fishing season historically. Um, and as a result of that, our, the, the Fisheries Management Council decided that if you don't know, don't go. And they've essentially closed the fishery until they actually learn how they could possibly manage it. And that's a perfectly valid management planning idea in the face of uncertainty. Sometimes you just have to say, we're going to stop. You won't see a lot of examples of that in the world, but I thought it was a bold one. From a not terribly uh, radical body, the North Pacific Marine Fisheries Council is run by the fishing industry in collaboration with other groups, but it's predominantly a fishing industry mechanism. All of those examples that I just shared are available on this research resource, um, cakex.org. You can go and use it for free. Uh, tonight at the Tools Cafe, you could get a tour of it and learn how it can be used for journalistic endeavors, not just uh, adaptation planning. And I invite you all to check that out. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me or find me later. <laughs>